members. And before we get into the program, let's do a roll call. I'm Fungus. My name is Chava. My name is Bonia. I'm Terrence Stewart. Cool. Yeah. And joining us today is Bonia. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself and the organizations that you work with? My name is Bonia Quarles, and I'm the co-founder and executive director of Starting Over and we are a transitional housing and re-entry service provider serving Riverside and Los Angeles counties. And one of our projects is the Riverside chapter of All of Us or None. Oh, cool. So um, what kind of activities or what kind of uh, things have been going on with the organizations and um, what, what, what other projects are you uh, working on right now? With the Riverside All of Us or None project, it's about a year and a half uh, strong now, and we've been in the organizing process, and now we're currently working on what we call Ban the Box, or actually it's called Fairness in Hiring Bill, and what we want to do um, at the local level is ask the city, just the city, to stop asking people if they've been convicted of a felony before allowing them to go through the employment process. Well, why, why do y'all feel that, that that's important? Well, we believe that with the shift from state penitentiaries to county jails, that Riverside is going to see a significant influx of people coming out of jail and or prison. And if we don't have something for them to do, then we are going to create a public safety issue, and we're actually creating more poverty and increasing recidivism. So by offering them em employment or allowing mm -hmm. them to participate in the employment process, it gives them an opportunity to do something else. So, so going back to there's going to be a, a, a change in the penitentiaries from the federal and state level, you think? Yes, that happened. Um, they called it AB 109, and basically the California or CDCR, California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, but the rehabilitation is usually silent. Um, what they did was they said that you're too overcrowded. The Supreme Court said you're too overcrowded, and they mandated um, them to lower the numbers in the state penitentiaries. And so instead of looking at how they could do something besides incarceration, they decided to funnel it down to the county levels. And so a lot of the counties are looking at building more jails to, to house the same number of people or increase the numbers. They just won't be housed at the state level, mm. at the prison level. So some people have been sentenced to like 14 years in the county jail which may be challenged as cruel and unusual punishment. Seems fair to challenge it like that. And, and well, with the Band the Box in Riverside County, could you elaborate more now that I feel like I caught up with everything? And I'm sorry, tell me whenever I do that, because I sometimes... No, it's, 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 it's good. Uh, I, would, I would love to tell you. Band the Box is actually at the city level. Um, the strategy was to do it at the city level first and see if we could do that and then go to the county level. So at this point, the Riverside Band the Box is at the city, and we're saying to the city to re-examine your hiring policies and practices because at this point, it discriminates against people who have been formerly incarcerated. Um, they don't have a box on the employment application for the city. A lot of cities and, and uh, localities like counties and stuff have gotten smarter than having the box on the application, so they don't put the box anymore but what they do is they exclude people who have certain felony convictions or, and even misdemeanor convictions from being able to complete an application. So, so in, I'm sorry. No, go, go ahead. Go ahead. So in effect, what it does, it does um, prevent certain people from um, going across this employment barrier, and that's what we call it. And uh, it's a barrier to employment. Mm. So how how would banning the box benefit society at large? I mean, I, I understand it affects people who have had um, um, you know, issues or, or been in prison or jail, um, but how, what about the rest of people? How does it benefit the community? The state of California incarcerates more people than any other state in the United States, and our country as a whole incarcerates more people than any other country on the planet. So we've definitely done our share of criminalizing our society. And when we do that, though, not only do we affect the person that's incarcerated, but that person's family, by extension, that person's
community, uh, we see it in the schools, we see it in, in higher education. It just it impacts us. And then people who own property pay taxes to support a budget that's taking from education and redistributing that money to the prison industrial complex. What are some of the, in the going back to then people or, or funneling people back out, out of prison, what are some of the, like the parameters of the guy? Like how are they basing who gets out? You mean to go from instead of going to prison to the county? Yeah, yeah. Oh, their their um, term is they take the non non non. Three nons. Well, yeah, three nons. Okay. Three nons. Non sexual, non violent, and non serious offenders are the people that are being uh, shifted from the state down to the county level. Um, and there was money that was supposed to be for what they call reentry because they understand that recidivism numbers are the, the high rate that they are now, which is about 70%, because we're not doing something in the community to allow these people to re-enter society. So they take the non-non-nons, and money was to be allocated to re-entry. Um, the breakdown across the state is that money ended up with sheriffs, um, district attorneys, and mental health got a portion of it. So pretty much the bulk of the money went to the same people who have an interest in incarceration. So it's kind of like an ethical dilemma or something that makes you go, hmm, is that right? You know, is that really going to work? But that's where the money's been allocated to. The sheriffs have the lion's share of the reentry money with very little money trickling down to community-based organizations. And I'm, I'm, I'm assuming this is the motivation for all of us none a year and a half ago when you and friends of yours started this organization. Yes, and I'm going to defer to Terrence on that because Terrence is probably one of the earliest um, All of Us or None members, and so he's he's been around. A lot of our clients are formerly incarcerated people, so many of them are All of Us or None. But Terrence wasn't a client. Terrence had, well, let me let Terrence tell what Terrence said. Oh, me? Um, with All of Us or None? I don't know. I came in, like, with All of Us or None, because I under, I worked with the Compton chapter, you know, and um, I came to Riverside and I was intrigued with what they were doing. And like we first came, and we were fundraising and doing for backpacks for the youth, you know, what I mean? who, who parents were like either incarcerated or formerly incarcerated. And then we passed out like about I think what, like 70, 80. Now, I'm, I'm like I may maybe way more. I know we packed a whole lot of backpacks and um. It was like a real good feel, you know what I mean? And then like to, like to come to be part of an organization that like has a concern of helping people with um, who, who, who are formerly incarcerated, you know what I mean? Get, get on their feet and take care of their family and take care of their own, you know what I mean? Instead of like asking for a handout or anything, I feel like that was real empowering and I wanted to be a part of that. It, it, to me, it makes a lot of sense because it, you guys, you know, on our notes, we're calling it fairness and hiring. Is that like a, for Band the Box, fairness and hiring is the, the name that you're campaigning under? Yes, there, there is a local Riverside um, campaign, but there's also state level campaigns right now. So Dickinson is the assembly member who has one bill, and there's a second bill, and I think it's eight. Let me give you the bill numbers. I think it's 218. I should get back to you on those bill numbers because I'm probably going to give you the wrong bill Do you numbers. have a, a website for the... You can go to leginfo.org and find out about um, the assembly bills or you can go to Riverside All of Us or None and we'll have the bill information there. You just search that online, Riverside All of Us or None? Is that the website? Dot com. Dot org. Dot org. Okay. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So um, there's also another uh, campaign that you're working on um, SB 61, Senate Bill 61. Can you elaborate more on that? Uh, SB 61 is a bill that um, was introduced this year and it's going to go to its first committee on April the 23rd, um, this month actually. And it's a bill that's saying let's re-examine how we treat our children when they're in juvenile facilities. Currently the practice is to house them in solitary confinement and these confinement periods can last from one day to months uh, at a time 
and psychologists and psychiatrists have done studies to kind of show the damaging effect that solitary confinement has not just on adults but it's even more intense when a person's brain is still developing what it does. 62% of the juveniles who commit suicide while incarcerated are either in solitary confinement or have just been released from solitary confinement. Wow. And so we think that a person should only be subjected to solitary confinement under specific control conditions. If they're a threat to themselves or you know, to the life of another person, then they should be placed in there, but only for a brief period of time, and they need psychological evaluation to assess whether they're you know, at risk for suicide. I mean, we don't treat our animals like that. We don't lock up dogs. We don't chain animals, but we think it's okay to do that to our children. It just, it just, it bothers me today. And then, like, even, even, even my research I did with the um, Pelican Bay hunger strike, I, it, it's, it's, it's obvious really that um, solitary confinement causes mental illness. And then, like she was saying before, like. Growing up in a juvenile hall system, a lot of times what happens is like some people might not be all the way mentally stable from the beginning, which drew them to jail in the first place. And then when they get up in there in, in the system, they still have a, a behavior because like they're, they're, there's something mentally wrong with them. And then to isolate them and put them in a box by themselves, it'll further like a lot of times mess up the kids even worse, you know, because like. I grew up like, you know what I mean? I, I wasn't saying this stuff, but I grew up in, in juvenile hall, you know what I mean? So it's like, I've seen a lot of these cases firsthand where it's not like, just like, this is just, we're talking about some made up fictional character. These are really kids growing up in these systems. And a lot of times they do have mental problems and you locking them up in these rooms. It's like, they're, they're becoming worse. They're getting in there, they're shouting, they're banging on the walls there, you know? And it's like, like somebody needs to say something about it because like, a lot of times when I was up in there, I was treated wrong, you know what I mean? I still have the scars of filth what, um, to show it. You know, I got my hand slammed in a door when I was a juvenile and all types of stuff. So, like, somewhere somebody needs to stand up for these kids because a lot of times, like, they're going through a whole lot in there and then, like, it, 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 it contributes to their mental illness if they already had one before they even stepped up into the place. And it seems to me like the... Solitary confinement in juvenile hall. Maybe a lot of people that don't experience that firsthand probably don't even know about that. That there that exists. Maybe let alone in the prisons in America, they might think it's something that you hear that happens overseas or something somewhere away from this country. But to kind of put it out there that it's happening, and there's a bill that is being pushed to take this down, or you know, in a way analyze what we're doing or analyze what's going on in the system is is very special and very like a, a lot of people will know a lot of people will be exposed to the fact that that's even happening and I, I think that's th that's obviously good. It's, it's true because I didn't know that that um, juveniles were locked up in solitary confinement I mean that's very cruel and you know that that stuff um, I mean that, that's 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 stuff where I thought you know some of the the toughest you know people in prison were were, were subject to, but not juveniles. I mean teenagers, yeah. children. They have them. They have them pretty much in like every juvenile facility from juvenile hall. You know what I mean? To like the camp programs. Um, like 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 the, I went to a camp program where they didn't have a a box. Cause like I guess like in 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 prison they call it the hole, but in mm -hmm. juvenile hall you call it more the box. You know. So like, like when I like when I would go to like like Afro Ball and Laverne, they didn't have a a, a a box, you know what I mean. So like, what they would do is like, if the kids who got in trouble there, they would ship them to um a, to another camp, and it's called Rocky up in um San Dimas, you know what I mean. So like, you'll go to the box up in um San Dimas, and um and like 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 you know what I mean. And that's where they have you isolated, and it's like a social death. Like, you'll be in a cell by yourself. For 24 hours, you're not coming out. You know what I mean. You come out like to take a shower. They'll bring you your food. The only person that you'll probably talk to is a person that like will hand you your food. You know what I mean. And like besides that, you're pretty much like cut off contact from from everybody. And can can being if you should light as to why they feel this is necessary to have solitary confinement in the way that it is. With the work that we've done with the sponsor, the sponsor for the SB61 bill is the Youth Justice Coalition out of Los Angeles. 
and um, through working with them because they tried to carry the bill last year so they're sponsoring it this year and they're doing a lot of the work and what we found is data is really hard to get because it's in the hands of uh, CDCR or juvenile justice um, and they're really really um, they really want to control the environment and they don't take kindly to people outside of the justice system telling them how to regulate they don't even like it when the legislators try to get in there and create laws that affect them. So they have some of the strongest lobbyists in the state, and they call them the badges. They just call those lobbyists, those are the badges, and they all come together. And so guess who the opposition to SB 61 is? It's the badges. And the badges are in control, and they want total control of those environments. And so they don't like people to come in and tell them. What they don't like about SB 61 is they don't like the definition of solitary confinement. That's what they say. Mm. Um, they don't like it defined as putting um, a child, and I say child and not juvenile, because I think when we use the word juvenile, it kind of uh, dehumanizes um, these children, because that's who they are. Mm -hmm. They're children and they're youth. They're, you know, this whole term of juveniles just kind of takes away from that. So these children or these youth are subjected to the whims of the juvenile justice system, which is very much like CDCR. I, I don't necessarily have a bone to pick with either of these yeah. entities, except right. for the fact of what they've done in the communities that I'm a part of. And when I've been on the inside, or when I've gone to visit, it's always the same. The jails are full of poor people of color. 